Hello, I'm Lenny Sorensen, and today I'm celebrating the enslaved workers in Montpelier's kitchens. There was, as in all kitchens, the hearth, the cooks, the technology of the kitchen itself, the hearth with its roasting spits and reflector ovens and kettles and Dutch ovens with lids and spiders on legs and griddles and trivets masonry stoves and cooking pots and bake ovens and they all needed to be heated and wiped down and cleaned and used in everyday cooking for the Montpelier family. Alcy Payne, who was born in 1806, was a cook here for a long, long time. They say it was 30 years that she cooked for the Madison family. However, when in 1824, Lafayette visited, she was only an 18-year-old house servant, probably part of the staff that really set up all of the preparations for the event, including polishing silver and organizing glassware and china and preparing the variety of meats well ahead to be stored for the day itself. And in her memory, she tells us, in the ice house, we had mutton, beef, chickens, turkeys, ducks, shoats, and almost anything you could think of. All of that had to be prepared ahead. Now, along with the many meat dishes, the cook, with probably Alcy as head scullion, would also have been making well ahead desserts, custards, cakes using eggs and cream and butter and sugar, um, jams, fruit jams, because it was in June, uh, for the breakfast table. There would have been gravies and pickles and bread rolls and salads and vegetable dishes of the season. And of course, Dolly Madison would have chosen that menu, but all of the enslaved workers, the cooks and the providers on the plantation would have been part of putting together all of those components to make up all of those dishes, particularly uh, the meat, which all had to be butchered and prepared ahead and kind of made cold. Um, and we're told that it was stored in the ice house. So that's really a good way of knowing uh, how much they could put ahead. There was also the cook Ellen Stewart White. Now she was pretty young and she missed the Lafayette visit. But she cooked in Washington for Mrs. Madison. In fact, in 1904, Celestine Eustace published a cookbook and included the recipe of how to serve chicken. And it was attributed to Ellen White, Mrs. Madison's cook. Now, although Ellen was probably too young to be a Montpelier cook, it does indicate that she learned from someone who had learned from someone probably here on this plantation. And she had taken this with her and earned uh, some reputation as a cook to be included in this um, list of recipes, how to serve chicken. Because serving chicken was not just something that you fried it up and you threw it on a, on a pan and everybody you know picked out the piece they wanted. Almost always preparing chicken meant after the bird was butchered and you had to decide were you going to roast the bird on a spit where you had to turn it before the fire to get it really golden and brown and to lard it they called it you'd take um, lard and flour and as it rotated you would brush it with lard and dust it with flour and brush it with lard and dust it with flour so that it had a beautiful rust um, uh, crusty uh, exterior to the meat. So, or if you might have creamed the chicken, it was a very famous recipe called Virginia chicken pudding, in which case the chicken had to be cut apart and poached 
and then mixed with a custard of eggs and cream and butter and then baked until it was beautiful on the top and then served at the table. So how to serve a chicken might have been any number of, of recipes. We don't know which one uh, it was. It seems as if there were both men and women that worked in the Montpelier kitchen. There were several kitchens, I get the idea, and food had to be, uh, for a large group of people, probably was prepared in, in several kitchens here and then taken to the event or taken to the main dining room. But the Madisons were uh, always uh, concerned about their, uh, about having a chicken, uh, excuse me, having a, a, a cook available. And he wrote of the heavy loss, which he called, uh, was caused by the death of a young fellow who was educated in Washington as a cook and was becoming, moreover, a competent gardener. So there you can see that many enslaved laborers had several occupations that they might do very, very well and be called upon at different times uh, to do. In September of 1842, Dolly wrote that she had recently lost, she said, a woman cook of great value to me. She, neither she nor, nor James mentions the names of these cooks that they had lost, but it certainly would have put a, a probably a crimp in the daily running uh, of the kitchen until they trained someone else or someone else in the kitchen had that kind of skill. Ellen was one of the few individuals who moved from Montpelier to Washington with Dolly in the 1840s. And she was probably pretty young, but it was her mother, Suki, who was Dolly Madison's lady's maid, and who also probably knew how to cook. Again, those multiple kinds of activities. In the same 1904 uh, cookbook is a recipe for bouillon a la James Madison, which is attributed to a cook born in James Madison's family which of course means within the enslaved community family. And we don't know how that recipe goes um, or how that person came to know that. A bouillon tends to be a soup, um, often clarified. So maybe it was a very rich chicken stock and full of the flavors of vegetables and the meat itself uh, to be presented as part of the soup course. It's, it's hard to know. And there were other cooks over the years that used this kind of equipment in all of the hearths that would have been uh, built and rebuilt here at uh, Montpelier. There was Catherine, Katie Taylor, born in 1825, and she seems to have also done cooking for Dolly in, in Washington uh, after Dolly moved there permanently, because in 1849, Dolly's niece, Anna Payne Coston, requested that Katie bake me a loaf of nice bread or some French rolls and I'll pay for the articles. Well, you know, a woman that can bake good, uh, uh, beautiful, nice bread and French rolls uh, really is uh, very skilled and capable. And cooks were, uh, enslaved cooks were sold for a lot of, quite a lot of money at that time. In 1856, uh, I, uh, one document uh, declares that a, a cook was went up for auction and uh, was going to bring $1,500 until uh, the family decided that they would keep her instead of selling her. So a uh, cook skills were built not only on uh, years and years of experience, but a wide breadth of, uh, of uh, dishes that she knew how to make, as well as being able, with this repertory of pots and pans and, and uh, uh, stoves and ovens to respond, especially in the Leith household like this, to some, sometimes 15 guests might arrive. And now the cook had to rise to the occasion to cook for that many more people, plus breakfast, plus tea, and of course the dinner at the end uh, uh, in the late afternoon. There were lists with cooks that sometimes are anonymous and uh, more than just that. We have a woman named Corrine who was a cook in the Montpelier kitchen. Her family, the descendants of her family tell, tell uh, that she was part of that. A lot of times we just don't know all of what they did and uh, 
what their daily uh, demands on their labor were, but we do have a good sense and we can have a good sense of the array of foods that they then cooked and the kinds of skills that they had to have.